Okay, let's see if the Great Wall power supply blows up. Let's build a wall to prevent these power supplies from being sold. Won't take a Mongol horde to make this Great Wall crumble. Looks like GN wants to shift to a new studio and so blow up their old one. Bet the efficiency will be under 80% and ripple above 120. These are the types of comments that surfaced when we posted teasers of our power supply testing for the Great Wall power supply used in the Walmart system. And to be fair, everything about it does look like a cheap power supply, but Great Wall actually is a supplier and makes PSUs for Corsair, for instance, as discussed in our Walmart case review. It's uncommon to find Great Wall power supplies unbranded in the Western market, and this one didn't even have the maximum 12 volt capabilities listed. So the unit did attract criticism from the community. What we're here to do is test whether or not it's deserving of all of that criticism using our new power supply testing setup to benchmark efficiency, ripple, and overcurrent protections. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Master Motherboard, which comes equipped with one of the more powerful Z390 VRMs for heavier overclocks on the new 9th gen Intel CPUs. The Aorus Master is also one of the few motherboards with a real heatsink this generation, featuring a mix of high surface area fins and looks oriented cover blocks. Oh, and it's also got updated RGB illumination. Learn more at the link below. Starting with the very basics first, just like in liquid coolers, there are typically only a couple of suppliers that actually make the core of the product before the big brands that you know do something a bit custom with them. So liquid coolers are a great example because Corsair, NDXT, EVGA, plenty of other people, they all ultimately kind of sell sort of the same product in that the base of it is likely Asetek. And there are some exceptions to that on Corsair's side that are new. But typically it's someone like Asetek or it is Asetek and they might have the same Gen 5 pump or Gen 6 pump they have slightly different tube lengths, they have different fans that are really important, they have different fan profiles, but the pump itself, the radiator, and the tube material, it's all gonna be the same. At the end of the day, there is a supplier behind things, and Great Wall is one of those. This is something we mentioned in our Walmart case review, where we were talking about suppliers like Jonesbow for the case market. Just to give a list of a couple of the more popular power supplies that Great Wall does make, Great Wall has made things like the Corsair CX500, the TX850, they've done the Rio Toro Enigma 850, OCZ ZX1000, and some of these are a bit better than others. The CX series is not really the best. The Enigma is from Rio Toro, OCZ is mostly dead at this point. But then there are other ones like the Corsair SF600, which actually has really good voltage ripple, and the CX450 is a cheaper power supply. It's been made by both Great Wall and Channel Wild Technology. Uh, the CS550M Green Label power supply, that's Great Wall. So Great Wall makes a lot of these, and to Corsair's credit, of course, they do things to improve them as well, so they might aid in some of the engineering. But the platform by Great Wall uh, is the heart of the product in those instances, and although this one is, is not rebranded, it is still a Great Wall product, and that list kind of shows that you may have even used one in the past. Before we get into the testing today, power supply testing is new for us, so we're still learning, we are still advancing our methods, there's a lot we know we can improve already, there's a lot we've already improved after this video goes live, but we have enough data here to do some basics, and the basics will be efficiency testing at different loads using a load generator, that's the Sun Moon 8800, we have a Sun Moon 220, for measuring that load. And then we also have a couple of other tools like an O-scope for measuring ripple. And we are using a new setup that's not in for this test today for fan speed and noise testing for power supplies. That's a really difficult problem to, to tackle and we've solved it pretty well. But it won't be showing up here today because we're building some of the setup for that. And instead of going through all of the details of our new power supply testing methodology here, what we're gonna do is finish the fan and noise testing side of PSU reviews and then make one video or article talking about how all the testing methodology will work. But today, the basics of what you need to know is that we're using an SM220, SM8800, an O-scope, and then we'll have some more information in the article linked in the description below. If you wanna check out some information on the loads that we used uh, on this Great Wall power supply and on this EVGA power supply just as a, a baseline branded competitor made by HEC. For this one, we're plotting the Great Wall 500 watt 80 plus power supply in the Walmart PC versus an EVGA 500 watt 80 plus model from about 2014. EVGA's power supply is made by HEC, while Great Wall is the supplier of its own unit. We'll start with the Great Wall power supply first. 
Version 1.42 of the ATX Desktop PSU Design Guide will move toward standardizing a 2% load number, but most power supplies still fail 2% efficiency testing as the guidelines are relatively new. At 2% load, Great Wall operates at 55.2% efficiency with an input of 18 watts and an output of about 10 watts, loading the 3.3 and 5 volt rails to 0.3 amps and 5 VSB to 1.5. This isn't a high-end power supply, so as load tapers in either direction, efficiency falls hard. We can give it a pass at 2% load as this is still a new enough specification that it's not being applied yet to these types of power supplies, but it's something to consider going forward. At 10% load, the Great Wall unit is at 77.7% .7 efficiency, which isn't great, but 80 plus doesn't require any 10% efficiency up until the titanium ratings, the recent titanium ratings that were added. It's 20% that starts to matter where the Great Wall power supply is at 83.1% efficiency, that clears the requirement for an 80 plus white label, which is 80% efficiency as the floor. 30% load has us at 84.6% efficiency, while 40% load has us at 85% efficiency. This is the peak of the curve, as 50% stays roughly the same with 84.9% efficiency. 80 plus certification requires 80% efficiency at 50% load, which this clears. It misses 80 plus bronze, but is close enough to error margins that we can give it a pass if it clears 100% load validation. Plus, we test maybe slightly differently than plug load would anyway. At 60%, we dip to 84.4% efficiency, then 83.4% at 70%, 82% at 80%, and eventually hit 80.3% efficiency at 100% load. Despite there being no public report for validating this power supply at the time of writing, and despite its lack of any official 80 plus certification and branding, which does cost money, it looks like this unit is at least 80 plus white efficient, or the base label, and is bordering on bronze efficiency, although the plug load group will test differently than we do. Let's look at the EVGA power supply next. This one is 56% efficient at 2% load, 76% efficient at 10% load, and is exactly tied with the Great Wall power supply at 20% load, or 83.1% efficiency, with the uh, efficiency trailing off after that. The EVGA power supply hits 84% efficiency at 50% load before dipping towards 80% at 100% load. We also included overload measurements where the Great Wall power supply does 77.7% .7 efficiency when loaded to 615 watts output or 792 watts input, which is really pretty damn good, all things considered. We'll talk OCP and current figures in a minute. The EVGA power supply at the same 615 watt load with the same current distribution does 75.4% efficiency at 123% load. Again, not bad. Both of these power supplies can sustain more than they advertise, which is always a great thing to see. This was measured on the Great Wall unit after a 40 minute load period to allow the power supply to reach steady state temperatures internally, but for the EVGA unit, it did eventually reach a shutdown point and we would have had to step down the current on the 12 volt rail in order to sustain operation. To put these percentage numbers into perspective, here's the input versus output power plotted for just the Great Wall power supply. This chart really helps visualize the efficiency curve with real numbers. This is power in versus DC out on the power supply. DC out would be what your PC receives and likely requests, while the input is what is required in the AC to DC conversion process. In terms of percentages, this power supply is its most efficient at 40% to 50% load and trails off toward the end of testing. 2% load is the least efficient of all, but because we're talking percentages versus absolutes in the previous chart versus this one, that isn't necessarily obvious on this kind of chart. The previous chart would be better for that, but this one helps visualize the actual power input and output numbers in watts. Voltage ripple is one of the most important metrics for determining the quality of power delivered to a system. A PSU can be efficient while still having bad ripple characteristics, which would introduce system instability or reduce overclocking headroom. We are using a Regal 1054 scope connected to the SM8800 via BNC for this testing, measuring VPP for ripple. We measured average voltage ripple on the 12 volt rails at about 39 millivolts under 20% load, 43 millivolts under 50% load, and 59 millivolts under 100% load, before peaking at 89 millivolts under 123% load. ATX spec calls for under 120 millivolts of ripple, for example, with the absolute best $500 power supplies nearing 10 to 15 millivolts of ripple, just for example, with 43 millivolts at 50% and 59 millivolts at 100%, the Great Wall power supply is simply fine. It isn't amazing, it isn't offensive, making for acceptable overall ripple on a dirt cheap power supply on the 12 volt line. The other rails are less important, the worst of which is 5 VSB towards the back end of testing. 12 volt ripple is better than one might anticipate of going solely based on the amount of comments calling for the explosion of this power supply. Again, it's not a great part, but it's not going to cause instability issues as a result 
of Ripple, at least on this kind of system that it was installed with. And in future power supply reviews, this is really just a preview of what we're working on, we'll be including some charts of the actual voltage ripple measurements so you can see how clean the signal is. And then we might be looking at transient response and things like that, along with fan and noise testing in the future. So last one here, OCP. Even though we said in our Walmart case review that Great Wall is a pretty common supplier, most of the concerns were still talking about the power supply, quote, blowing up or catching on fire as a result of overdrawing current. We tested OCP on this unit. Great Wall says that this power supply should be able to take at least 40 amps on the 12 volt rail. So we set the 3.3 and 5 volt rails at 3.4 amps, VSB to 1.5, then pushed the 12 volt rail until it hit 40 amps. The power supply ran inefficiently, of course, but it didn't shut down or overheat. This was for a minimum of 30 to 40 minutes to reach steady state. And we switched our SM8800 into amps mode and increased the current until we hit a breaking point. For the Great Wall 500 watt unit, that breaking point was approximately 56 amps, demanding 672 watts down three 12 volt cables alone, or 707 watts total against all of our settings. VRMS fell to 111.95 volts, efficiency was 77.7%, and Ripple was about 92 millivolts on the ATX header, and in the 80s for EPS and 12 volt headers. But overall, it did survive, and that's 123% load. So really, it's I mean, it's not supposed to run that high anyway. The power supply ended up tripping OCP and safely shutting itself down when pushed this hard. At 50 amps, or 123% total power, it continued operation and did not trip any protection, so it was not at any major risk of catastrophic failure because it was capable of handling it. Once we went over 50 amps, that's when it started just tripping OCP almost immediately. Concluding this one, the Great Wall 500 watt power supply, which is uh, it's got a name of GW6000 in the model, and it does technically say 80 plus on it, although there's no sticker, it's just part of the model name. So that's what we're working with here, and it's actually okay. It's inoffensive. It is not an exciting power supply, it is not a high quality power supply, but it's not a, a really tremendously low quality power supply either. It's just fine. The voltage ripple is acceptable, especially for a 500 watt, ultra budget power supply and we've spoken with some sources in the industry and these are incredibly cheap because Walmart could have put a branded power supply in their system like a lot of the system builders do for example iBuy power typically uses the sort of branded power supplies that you were all familiar with they could have done that uh, or they could have had more margin and they chose more margin and this one it's it's probably I mean it's it's probably better than some of the other low-end power supplies on the market that are branded by companies that you all know because it's just it's fine so not really the most exciting it didn't blow up if that's what you're waiting for i'm sorry it did not do that but uh it also didn't post the best ripple numbers in the world didn't post the best efficiency numbers in the world it's simply okay so walmart for their part uh or their their supplier o oem's part their system builders part the power supply is not horrible the rest of the computer, the part selection, like the motherboard, for example, really weird USB Type-C selection, uh, the case is terrible, but the power supply is actually okay. So this is the one part of that build, other, unless you count silicon like the CPU, this is the one part of that build that's actually somewhat redeeming. <laughs> so uh, we would still absolutely not recommend buying one of the overpowered PCs, especially because if you look at our case review maybe we can put one of those charts on the screen uh, the delta for the internal component temperature by removing the front panel of that case that glass panel it's it's is it 40 degrees it's over 30 degrees whatever it was it's a huge delta and that case is just suffocating everything in it so that's bad and then uh, the price was really bad and they did drop it a little bit after all the videos and coverage but it's still just not a good deal services is, is not good in the experience we've had uh, other youtubers have posted content like kyle bitwit and linus tech tips and they've had issues with cables being disconnected on arrival so still wouldn't recommend it but strictly speaking of power supplies it's actually okay now you could complain that the cables aren't pretty you could complain the box isn't pretty the cables you have a better point because these are visible inside the case if you're paying over two thousand dollars for the high-end system and you've got this kind of mess inside the case, yeah, you deserve a better power supply for that kind of money. Absolutely, uh, if only for the looks. But 
functionally, it's acceptable. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Uh, power supply stuff is going to get really interesting coming up, so make sure you subscribe to catch more of that. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats or shirts, and patreon.com slash gamersnexus tops out directly, where we'll also be posting some extra behind-the-scenes stuff on power supply testing as we further iterate it. We posted one maybe two or three weeks ago already. So, uh, and then one final note, we do have a lot of cool things we're doing with this type of testing that didn't make it into this video because it just wasn't ready yet. But we're working on it. So definitely check back soon because we should have some O-scope shots. We'll have uh, fan speed versus power response. We'll have noise testing, thermal testing, all that stuff. So thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.